Golly. Good day to you. See you later.
boys, how's it going? I wanted to talk about this video that you've all seen floating around on the internet. I miss the old iDubs. It's a 17 minute long apology video for the content cop videos that iDubs is most famous for. Now ladies and gentlemen, I want to start off this video by saying it's pretty off the cuff. I just want to kind of throw out tangents because this has been on my feed for the last few days. Everyone's pretty much talked about it. And I've had a few things that I wanted to bring up as well, being the fact that I was pretty invested in this entire community back during its heyday. Now, obviously, iDubs is a pretty big inspiration for some of the content that I've produced on this channel, especially when it comes to commentaries and critiquing individuals. But iDubs is part of a larger group of content creators. You know, your Filthy Franks, your H3H3, your uh, Max Mofo, your Anything for Views. These guys collaborated together and they produce some of the funniest content, but also some of the edgiest content. Edgy content in the sense that this was some TOS violating shit back in the day. Now, obviously, iDubs has changed as a person in recent years. Uh, there hasn't been a content cop in a while. He's done two boxing events, uh, fuck around with squirrels for a bit. And uh, last I checked, all right, he was making the most fa satisfying fidget toy, okay? So he's changed. All right, he's, he's deviated from, from what he used to be doing. Uh, and to give you a little bit of an idea, all right, iDubs was the kind of guy that was, it's all okay or none of it's okay. I mean, to show you, iDubs is over here with the Quran, a machete, so on and so forth. And of course, if you think the Quran standing over here was just one example, iDubs is one of those dudes that honestly would have, I'm surprised he hasn't gotten a fatwa at this point, okay? That's weird that it was sent from an electronics place and it's the full-blown Quran. Some of you guys didn't bat an eye when I broke that Jesus VHS over my knee, but I know there's going to be a lot of people in the audience just cringing when I... Yeah, he ripped the whole thing in half. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, obviously, this guy was an edgier character. I would argue more edgier than all the other horsemen of the apocalypse back in the day. And uh, to be honest with you, I personally, while I should be offended at the fact that iDubs did that as a Muslim person... Uh, I tend to just look the other way and not get so emotionally involved with anything on the internet. Obviously, iDubs was also most famous for the N-word, F-word slur, okay? And uh, this slur was kind of the most, like, important catchphrase, okay? Everyone said it. This was the one thing that, like, if you looked up iDubs in, in the Urban Dictionary, he was the guy that made this slur. He fused the N-word and the F slur together, like Tears of the Kingdom, and that was pretty much how he went on with. Now, obviously, in recent years, iDubs has changed. And I'm pretty sure that as he gets older and he develops more life experiences, because last time I talked about him when it came to like his sex worker rant, I really did feel like iDubs didn't have a crazy amount of life experiences. He honestly thought that, you know, working in, in like the uh, adult entertainment industry wouldn't have any impact in applying for a job application at least it seemed at the time. Why would an employer care? Honestly, dude, if you're applying for a public facing job where names can be Google, pretty good chance that you don't want your like uh you don't want somebody in your company uh their second or third result being like a gangbang okay there's it's very simple to understand why uh people think that way okay you know your teachers at school you look up her name and bam or his name and bam you come across like gangbang butthole like prolapses so on and so forth easy to understand now that you think about it with that context so obviously, ever since iDubs made that video, I realized this is somebody that I, I, I just don't see having crazy amounts of life experiences. When he was making this kind of content, he was like 28 years old, okay? So my age now, he was not some young teenager. This is a guy that had edgy humor nearly up to his 30s, okay? So now that he's 32, he has discovered empath, okay? He's, he's become an empathetic person. He's got some empathy now, all right? Care for the human people around him. Now, I'm not here to gatekeep progress. I think everyone grows at a different rate. I just think it's kind of cringy that now you've discovered it. Now, obviously, there's a bit of criticism as to you've magically discovered empathy now that, you know, the YouTube system has changed, the internet has went less edgier, and now you got to be more brand friendly if you want to keep your career or meal ticket alive. And I would argue the internet is actually more popular. Okay? In 2023 internet, with some of the wild shit we have floating around, it pays more. Toxic, okay, you're either you're completely non-toxic or you go right off the deep end. The algorithm rewards only extreme. Never rewards people that critically think. So this part is actually quite important too. I just want to stress the fact that obviously a lot of criticism could be that he's just cleaning up his image now for brands in the future. 
And, uh, yeah, well, that could absolutely be true. No no joke about it. But to me, I, I think when I watch this video, I know I know he knows that this is a bad move because it's going to piss off every side of his audience. Speaking openly and candidly and self-introspection are things that rarely go fucking well on the internet, especially when you bring your fans on the content that you used to produce, uh, the, the content that pretty much put you where you're at, the reason why a lot of your core fan base is the way that they are, by ostracizing yourself from that, cutting yourself off of it, you kind of like pretty much sow the seed in a lot of your fan base's head that they're the ones in the wrong. I'm sure there's a lot of amazing iDubs fans that are totally normal people that like edgy content and that is what it is, right? It's, it's how the internet works. Just like there's a small but absolutely vocal subset of his audience that just loves to look at the comedy and loves, loves to look at the slurs and goes crazy. I'm a lot like iDubs when it comes to it's all okay or none of it's okay, right? Uh, I just don't like to use really, really bad slurs in a video because I think it just will make somebody feel really shitty if they watch my videos, okay? I, I kind of put the N word, the B word, the F word, all these words into the same pool, okay? Uh, I, I can make a joke without going down that deep path, okay? I can, I can make a joke without touching that. And I know that Ian can too. It's just obviously his brand of comedy is more the shock era, but we'll get to all of this in a little Obviously, one of the reasons for this video was he had a come to Jesus moment when he came towards fans in real life. And we've all seen like clips from the Anthony Padilla podcast where, you know, he kind of called some of those fans basement dwellers because some of those people came up and said the NF slur to him in person. And again, it's like, what did you expect the audience to do, right? Like that's, that's, that, that's the kind of joke that you were saying. Obviously, people are going to come up to you and say the same wild shit that you've been saying. But there was another example that he actually mentioned in this apology video, which I'm going to get to now. He realized that as he came across certain fans in real life, some of them said these racial catch slur, uh, catchphrases. And he didn't like that, okay? It was like, God damn, that kind of hit me for a loop. Now, every creator comes across their fans, okay, at some point. Now, I've had great experiences with my fans, all right? Awesome experiences. You guys are great, all right? God damn, I love you. But generally, when it came to Ian, his relationship with certain fan bases, not all, obviously, but certain ones of them were just going up and saying, hey, Ian, and Essler. And there was one case where, like, a trans person came up to Ian and was like, damn, I know you don't like me. You probably don't like me. But can we get a photo together? This threw him for a loop, and he was like, god damn. Maybe I got to course correct, change myself a little bit. And that's pretty much what sparked this big change, apparently, in Ian. And he grew up, okay? Generally, when you get past 30, okay, having My your, you know, like edgy Discord you. jokes don't you. really fly anymore. You grow out of it. And I think a lot of it is due to the fact that as he gets older, as he develops a new friend circle or goes out and...
Hmm, so my information was correct, as usual. Interesting. Well, I don't suppose they pose any sort of threat of interference with our operation. But perhaps they have a need for some of our excellent manufactured products. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, I do have something you could do, actually. Lieutenant Doran and his followers up in the north need their regular supplies from us. They haven't been delivered, and with the trolls attacking, I'll need someone to do it. Doran's camp lies northwest of the road at the entrance to Stranglethorn from Duskwood. Give the supplies to Private Thorson. If he's not in the camp, then he'll be patrolling south of it. He'll take care of them. Mind you, if you fail, you'll owe me restitution. Baron Revelgaz has had me keep an ear out for rumors of the strange and out of place in Booty Bay and Stranglethorn. I don't usually put much stock in ghost stories. But I heard some sailors in the tavern talking about a haunted island off the coast. Water elementals and a raving goblin ghost, they say. If you're going to go talk to Revilgaz, could you relay that story to him? He's done it this time. Bad enough that Gelriz is muscling out the moguls who were appointed by the trade princes. Now he tries to cut in on the most notorious pirate. Revilgaz won't have it. And he's told me to take care of the problem in my own way. My way? Theft. The venture company geologists near Lake Nasferidi are deeply interested in those strange blue crystals they have been finding in the mines. Bring me samples of the stone from their geologists. I don't care what you have to do to get them. Interesting. Some time ago I seem to remember reading a book once that suggested... Ah, of course, a troll legend it was. If what Krasek reports is true, perhaps I will soon be able to add the Stone of the Tides to my collection of ancient artifacts and relics. If there is indeed a goblin mage and water elementals haunting the island, it could mean the Stone of the Tides can be mine. I want you to locate this haunted island. Find out what's going on. Oh, and if you perhaps want to find out more about the Stone of the Tides, take this script to the Stormwind Library. They should be able to find you a copy of the book I first came across the legend in. Could it be that Gazbon actually discovered the stone? Interesting.
much time you have. It's how you use it. Please get him before right, he blows ah! No! No! She's dead! Oh my god. Oh my god. Holy another shit. Fall, another fall. Oh! Oh! Starts now. Welcome to Summoner's Rift. Thirty seconds until minions spawn.
miss. Watch this line of sight. Okay, it's not line of sight. Don't watch it. Summon th the Urshist? What the hell is that? Wait, he just... What the... Une chaîne d'un gars qui fait des petits reportages sur des clubs de foot, soit pas trop connus ou quoi, avec des petites histoires assez intéressantes autour de ça. Je vous invite à regarder. C'est le premier qui m'est venu en tête, mais il y en a eh plein d'autres que vous pourrez vous, vous proposer de regarder. Mais là, j'en ai pas là comme ça tout de suite. Mais il y en a plein. Sans transition, Ivic. On va parler d'autre chose. On parlait au début de ton influence. Welcome to my inn, weary traveler. What can I do for you? I'll take a miner here just to be careful because I'm going to pull this too. Oh my god, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Yeah, I'm dead. Holy shit, that blows. Yeah, I'm dead. Oh. Wow. Can I get out? Somebody tell me if I can get out! going in. Great to meet you. Off with you. Mm -hmm. 
the loot. Give me the loot. All right, I got Dextrin. I got head of Tongaroar. I promise to you sometimes. Going in. <laughs> I'm almost done. <laughs> You're full mana, bro. I had two mobs on me. Alright, come here. Just leave, just leave, 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 leave. Bro, what? Bro! Dude, wh why are you running from me, man? What? I had two mobs on me. Like, it's why are you running from me, bro? Like, I told you to leave. What? Man. How do we go down like this? I told you to leave, bro. Okay, this is fine. This is good. This is good. This is good, because you can make a class you like. Like, they hit way too hard, man. Und das darf nicht passieren. Das darf auf gar keinen Fall passieren. Ich bin tot. Nee, ich bin tot. Ich bin tot. Ich bin tot. Ich bin tot. Ja, Almast Hound. Oh, it's the second pack also. Oh, bro, 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 bro.
the assassin with no master. Um, at the risk of, <laughs> I don't want to burn any bridges, but just being very frank about strategy. Um, the challenging part for that is that when I realized, because I realized pretty on, I was like, oh, this is going to be a disaster. Um, a guest of my platform size makes the missteps that I did. That should not be able to like derail the podcast in the way that they were saying it was. I have 5,000 Twitter Twitter followers. I have like 700 subs on a YouTube channel that I've never live streamed from, that I have no content on, and I've started doing this six months ago. I've been watch like consuming all of this content for years, but I've, I've never engaged, chatted, commented, nothing until six months ago. So whatever channel is several years old, Brian's been making content for like. Thirty seconds until minions spawn.
Red Bull gives you wings. What the fuck are all these feathers, man? I shouldn't be going this far to get them. They're all over the damn map. I'm going all the way to the east side of the map. It's just like, oh baby. You gotta go back to there. Gonna get an Ogden Togger. Uh, what is that again? Oh, it's an RNG potion. Oh, okay. Probably not, because isn't there a potion that can kill you? That potion, that quest one? <laughs> Can't you die from that? Yeah, yeah. This was just a collection quest, and he was like, "Son of a commitment." They came. Turns into a skeleton. And skeletons are dead, so you need to delete. Oh shit, dude! They get you with the fucking stipulation, huh? Feather. Oh, there's two fucking feathers right there next to each other. That's fantastic, dude. And I didn't see one of those. One of the two combos. Mm, okay. We have to go in there, too, right? No. Wait, how do we get up there? Cave grinding way faster. I agree. Well, 
understand. Maybe it's now. to accept the Western city? Oh, only if I turn in this one, though. Motherfucker. Well, fuck both you guys. Wait, what? Holy necklace bounty. Wait, where is this? Wait, what number is this? 24. Oh, it's the repeat rule, that's why. Except school rock cleanup. Okay. Gee, bus. Hopefully we get caught up when you start. We we'll have to start clicking through that shit. Max level 60. Decade, I'm pretty sure. Prepared content now he's pivoted to the live streaming. They have over 4 million subscribers. They had 25, 20, up to like 30,000 concurrent viewers. Like, and they have the mic and it's a 6v4. Okay, like my misstep should not be lead, like with all of that experience under their belt, they should not be able, like, like kicking, kicking me. Noise. They should find a way to do it. Again, like I'm being annoying and I'm being combative or whatever, but like if I was being that way, like on Fresh and Fit, I really. Yeah, I saw this. <laughs> We talked a little bit about it last night. Um, there's a stupid reason she's giving up, but she's in the right. Those lizards could have easily moved off of that personal shit. It's a dating podcast, my dude. I don't know why you'd expect people to move off the personal stuff. I think that if you're going to go and you're going to be really combative, at the very least, you need to have like good answers prepared for questions you know you're going to get hit with, right? So like the the dating thing is obviously big. Whenever you're going on a date, uh, are you a virgin? Like these are questions. Enjoy the whatever podcast. Thanks. These are questions you know you're going to get hit with. If you don't want to answer them, then you have to figure out what you want your answer to be. You can't just like try to like spitball it on the spot and figure out like how you're going to be as evasive as possible because obviously um, people are going to drill really hardcore in on that. That's 100% going to be the case. They talked about other stuff, but kept bringing it back to that. Yeah, because it kept coming back up. But I mean, again, like that's of course it's going to happen. Um, and you could tell they after they had figured out that like her and Aaron were mineable, were a wealthy resource of Mads, that they were um, going to start mining that, and they did. They focused hardcore on it. But I mean, what do you want me to say? I read so much. I wish I actually would have done this six months ago for this red pill. Sh um, I read so much. I threw together a good outline. I like outlined good questions. Um, I had my topics all cut up. Rollo ended up being so passive on everything. The Michael dude ended up arguing with me 80% of the time. It was like a real life Mott and Bailey because the um, Michael guy seems a lot more reasonable than Rollo. And something that's interesting or upsetting. Why don't you do a research game? Cause I can't. I don't, I don't know if I can actually. I don't know if I can research now right now with you retards in the background. It actually, drives me insane. The, like people asking the most random, retarded, stupid questions on every thing that I do is like. I don't know if my brain can like handle. Like, yeah, it's just stupid. Yeah, I, I don't think people realized. Um, 
or maybe they did, I'm not sure. This dual nading hypothesis, this alpha beta bucks thing is like the center point to all of uh, Rolo's ideology. And it completely fell apart. These guys like didn't defend a single point. But I don't even know if it came across or it because everything was so cordial. But I don't know. Intro rules. Oh yeah. Well, cause since I'd done so much like research on this, um, I wanted to be like a very data driven discussion. So I wanted to I thought if I set out Oh, I'm really glad that I set these ground rules down actually, because it let me refer back to them a couple times when because notice how once they realized they didn't have the data on their side, even the Michael guy started I felt I was, maybe I was too friendly. No, I wasn't too friendly. I was the appropriate level friendly. Even the Michael guy started saying like, listen, I know it's anecdotal, but I know so many girls in Vegas. I know so many girls on Instagram. I know so many guys that have this problem. Too many women that I know that are absolutely have a sugar daddy while fucking Brock the bartender at the same time. Uh, and, and so uh, again, it's just anecdotal, it's not statistic. Like notice how as soon as they realized they didn't have the data on their side, Michael kind of like retreating back to those types of arguments. But then I could refer back to the initial rules. And I was like, hey, well remember for the initial rule set, um, we all said that we weren't going to appeal to uh, anecdote, right? We were just going to appeal to studies. We were going to, yeah. So I'm trying to keep everything data driven. I know you bring up your strippers. Yeah. The best part was when they were like, oh, yeah, we all agree. Yeah, but I had to keep saying because they kept trying to do that. Well, I think we mostly agree. Myron kept saying, that. I was like, no, hold on. We don't agree. We don't agree on this. We don't agree on this. We don't agree on this. Just to be clear. You guys aren't disagreeing with each other. You're and just saying you specifically volume is have the biggest that. driving yeah. factor, which means you have to go out there. And we all agree. Just, you're correct. Sure. Um, we can agree, but I don't yeah. believe in the dual mate thing at all. Okay. Um, um, I don't okay. believe in alpha fucks, beta bucks at all. Okay. Um, I don't believe that status and class are your major determining factors for fucking. Um, so if you want to say you agree with me, that's fine. But when I go back to my stream, I'm going to have this exact same message. I don't know if you guys, when you're on your other panels, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, like it doesn't really matter if you're that tall, you make that much money. The, the real drive is that you're actually going out there trying to fuck women. Because that's what I'm saying. That's like 95% of the equation. Yeah, I, I don't think so okay. I think it's what sure. we disagree. I think okay. it's maybe 40%. The numbers the are a okay. little bit yeah. off. I feel like the standard red pill is going to be more like 10 to 25%. Because when you look at the red pill advice for getting women, the advice is always to work I, on these ancillary, I, I ancillary think, things. I think, to get stronger, get more money, I think increase you're status. confusing that with black pill. No, 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 hold on. No, no, red pill says to get women, you need to get money, you need to get status, yes. you need to get And black right? pill yeah. believes that's all you need to, in order to get money. That's why well, I, that, I well, think you're, black you're complaining with you black pill. Black pill says you can't increase your market sexual value ever, I don't think. Well, no, you can if you get more money. They, they, I don't think black, black pill believes that. Black, 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 black pill is basically yeah. a, prescri it's a nihilistic, despondent prescription based on red pill. I, I think black pill says no matter how much money you get, you can buy sex maybe, but a woman is never going to like your love if you don't have like the giga <laughs> Michael Sartain doesn't believe in dual mating, right? Um, he cannot believe in dual mating if he doesn't want to. But remember, all of Rolo Tomasi's ideology revolves around this alpha beta bucks thing. He says it all the time, and it's the underpinning to his entire analysis of like how women procreate, right? Um, he still says we appeal to those anecdotes in the eyes of his audience. He did it many times beyond what you call it. Yeah, but I can't call out every single time. I can't, or else I start to look like. Balancing my reputation of these shows is very, 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 very difficult. I don't even realize, like, I'm literally coming in as a blue-haired um, and I'm supposed to be trying to argue against, like, the classic red pillars. Like, I'm fighting from behind so much. The reputation and rhetorical management is, it has to be something I'm constantly keeping in, in, um, in mind on my side. I can't be, like, screeching and... Have you ever passed your debate prep through anyone else, like when you do manifestos? Um, I talked to the Alex Dating guy on Twitter. I should have shouted him out, actually. Um, I talked to Erudite a bit. Um, I think I passed it through Farah. Um, I think I talked with Mel with some of the points. I like bounce a little bit, but mo most of this is actually just... I just had to go and read some of the stuff that gets cited, like especially about the dueling stuff, and then look up like actual data and studies, and I find that like most of what they're saying is kind of bullshit, but yeah. My understanding of Alpha Flex Beta Box was that when hooking up girls are prioritized looks and physical attractiveness, but when it comes to relationships, they will prioritize well and stability. Do you disagree with that? Basically, yes. I don't think that's true. There's no data whatsoever to support that. Um, but there, the Alpha Flex Beta Box goes more into that and says that when girls are on the fertile part of their cycle, that they'll look for attractive guys, but on the rest of their cycle, they'll look for financially stable guys. That's like the theory, basically. But nobody in Evo's psych believes this anymore. It was a theory um, for a couple decades. And then like, but they never, there's no data whatsoever. There's no data whatsoever to support any of that. So it was at least nice when the dude defended you from the dono, tried to dismiss you for being gay. Oh yeah, sure. Here's a secret. If you want to know if someone is going to just pivot away from data or argument, ask us what's ahead of a debate to review. 
not one of these fucks about anything. Well, I gave them a list of topics to talk about coming into this, actually, because I did want them to be somewhat prepared on it. Because I believe Myron asked me, you make the argument that women would be evolutionarily be incentivized to sleep with men that don't sleep with women because they're resources. Is that true if we shared resources and tribes? Yes. Again, like I said, like it's all like, um, all of this is super data driven. Um, yeah. What was the uh, reception from the Red Pill community based on your performance? Uh, my reception was really, 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 really good on both podcasts. I think on the Whatever Show and on the um, Fresh and Fit Show, I think my reception is about as positive as it ever could have been. Um, I get a lot of emails, a lot of DMs. The comments are overwhelmingly positive, but... How far did you get into Pokemon Blue during the Whatever Show? Um, not at all. He brought that Game Boy out and he was like, Hey, you can play this. And then I, as soon as I started to, he shouted at me, you f piece of shit. It's insane they all still let you on their shows. It's the only pushback to their entire community. Why do you think they keep inviting you? Uh, well, personally, it's because I'm a friendly, funny guy, I think. Because they can have good shows with me. Like, I think that helps a lot. I think that's actually probably one of the most important parts. Um, but the second part is uh, I, do, I do help these guys do really good viewership. Um, something that I've noticed more and more as I go around on the internet, I think a lot of people view bought almost everything. I think people bought their Instagrams, I think people bought their Twitters, I think people bought a lot of their viewership. I'm starting to feel that more and more. Um, but when I go on these shows, a lot of them do like the highest viewership. Like I think they're, I think they had the most live viewership they had in the history of their, um, in the history of their podcast when I was on for their live show. I don't know what their VOD did. And then Fresh and Fit's live shows, I think initially, I think the highest the Rolo Destiny debate got was like 30,000 plus viewers, uh, but obviously they started to taper off when people realized there weren't going to be fireworks. Um, what do you think about this Trader Raid stuff? Do you think it reflects poorly on you? Um, at the risk of, <laughs> I don't want to burn any bridges, but just being very frank about strategy. Um, the challenging part for that is that when I realized, because I realized pretty on, I was like, oh, shit, this is going to be a disaster. Um, usually what, what I, my goal, this is such, this is so dumb because they're very niche strategy because they're very niche situations, but I feel like somebody is on a show and we're ostensibly, we're on the same side. Um, and if we're on the same side, we're supposedly we're on the same side. I'm, I can't, I can't like, I don't want to tie myself to them. Like I don't want to hitch onto their wagon because I, I can't defend their arguments, but, um, I think that the um, the goal is to try to separate myself as much as possible, and I try to only come in at the end, basically, to summarize or to give like a good, nuanced or fair perspective of whatever they're trying to say. So there are a few times where I think Pixie was arguing, and then I would come in at the end and I'd say, "Well, patriarchy is like this thing," or "Wouldn't this be unfair?" or this to try to like summarize. But I have to be um, I have to be very, 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 very careful because if I jump in too much, then um, if I jump in too much, then obviously it looks like I agree with other arguments, and I don't, and I don't want to get like the crazy SJW label, so I have to be, I have to be super chill, yeah. After disclosing that they're your friends, fence sitting looks really bad in my opinion. Uh, I disagree completely. I think that, I, I really do think, I think that the Rolo podcast and I think that that whatever podcast, I think I handled both of them almost perfectly. Um, usually there are problems I have with my conduct or performance and I think there are things I could do way better, but I think for the whatever podcast, I think I straddled that line about perfectly. Like I summarized their arguments when I agreed with them and I gave a point or two to, to show like where I agreed or disagreed. Um, I think when they got kicked off, I don't think it looked like I like had hitched my wagon to their arguments. Um, I, I think I handled it about as well as I could have. What was it, the brunette girl? She was really coming for you. Oh, we chatted a lot after the show. She actually has insane autism. Um, it's very rare that I run into people that are like actually autistic because I'm pretty sure um, like 95% of people on the internet today fakes their autism. They pretend they have autism, but they don't. They just use it as an excuse. Um, that girl actually has super autism. Um, damn, we were chatting a lot after the show. She can't even like hold eye contact. Like she is, she's like the surgeon. She is a surgeon. Like she looks like this and she just says like super random shit and it was like really crazy um but um yeah no i mean like we're cool we chatted afterwards and everything i don't remember um 
She said she was during the show. Yeah, but unfortunately, autism is like autism is one of those kind of like trendy diseases now that everybody says they have. So when somebody says they have autism, I, I just assume that it means you're an attention whore. I don't I don't assume anything anymore when somebody says they have autism. It's like ADHD, autism, depression. Um, like unless you've got a prescription for some shit, and even if you have a prescription, I don't even know, dude. I, like everything is like so fucking crazy today when it comes to mental health stuff on the internet. Like those are two very different things. Did the data driven argument feel more productive than the spontaneous ones? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I actually really enjoyed this. I enjoyed this conversation. Even though I kind of crammed hard for this in like a day and a half, uh, doing prepared research for a debate to jump in and do it is something I miss doing. It's fun. Uh, I think Sneeko helped you as it gave you credit. Do you agree? Um... <laughs> I think um, I think the Sneeko one was similar to the whatever one where I had to find a way to distance myself because like me and Sneeko will agree on some things, but obviously on like most of the shit he was saying, I didn't agree. So it kind of turned into a 3v1 at points or I had to like back off and let them like deal with him basically. Um, or try to provide a good summary at the end of what he was saying. Like I think at one point I was like, Sneeko's just saying that marriage is the foundation of society and you should be geared towards family building. But uh, yeah, I had to be super careful not to hitch my wagon for that either who do you think is the most effective red pill debate opponent myron or michael sartain the michael guy i the, i hate i don't want to i don't want to compliment him i the michael guy seems cool and he seems like a decent guy and it seems like he has a decent perspective on dating and women but i don't know that because every time these guys are around me they become the most mild-mannered people in the world right so like i don't want to say that and somebody links me down later where michael's like this is why women are sluts and why they're gonna try to f you in divorce and blah 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 and i'm like <laughs> Um, but he seemed, here's the big deal, okay? He seemed like a guy that actually liked women, okay? And in most of these red pill spaces, it feels like they hate women, okay? All of these guys seem like they hate women. Um, that's what it feels like. But the Michael guy seemed like he didn't feel that way, so. Yeah, so for the, if that's the case, he doesn't hate women, he already gets like mad props from me. Um, Oh, but also, I will say this too also, P big props to Myron for being able to set up that kind of conversation on his podcast and be chill and do like a decent job moderating. I'm pretty sure Myron disagrees like 95% of the shit that I was saying. There's a lot of what I was challenging Rollo on challenges Myron too, but for the most part, he like kept it moving, kept it chill. Like Myron did a really, really, really good job at setting that conversation up, having a platform to have that conversation, and then um, being like a relatively neutral moderator during all of it. So, congrats to him. Jesus, I would never have expected that Myron would be the guy that we're looking to for debates. Um, yeah. Oh, damn. And I think the most... Um, you called Fresh and Fit clowns to your face. Yeah, I did. That's just like a funny word for me. I think it might be more serious to them, though. I should have... I probably shouldn't have said that. But I think they knew I was joking. When I would bring up, like, Andrew Tate tweets and Bugattis and all that shit, a lot of the times, um, these two clowns would tell me, they'd say, oh, this stuff is just a proxy for uh, success. You know, you don't actually need the Bugatti. You need the ability to buy the Bugatti. You don't need to travel the world. You need to be, have freedom, you know, and all these things. So... He's lucky we're moderating. Yeah, yeah man. So it seems like... So it feels like a... Lamborghini. <laughs> but I forgot, like, clownish is like a funny word for me. But I think, I think in their vernacular, I think it's more serious. <laughs> Um, I, but I don't know. I thought it was fine. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, the one thing that was... Oh, Rollo barely saying anything. He was so mad. Yeah. He, apparently, he's liking cuck tweets about me, guys. I don't feel as bad. But I want to be honest. If they would have been any more aggressive... Rollo's strategy for being very, very, very passive and very submissive to me was a very good idea. Because I would have roasted him so hard. There were times in that show where I saw him. He was, like, in his phone. He was, like... He was scrolling like a mother on that shit and we both sent each other a big list of topics beforehand for what we were going to debate so it's not like they got caught off guard um all right is there a list of topics you want to debate and i said a lot of these will focus on the dual mating hypothesis and hypergamy um and tell him to bring a real definition of alpha male hypergamy and maybe high value male if he wants because those were the things that i wanted to focus on and then they gave me a list of like 20 topics and i was like okay you brought like a book and everything like, it looked like these guys were ready to to go hard, but then, you, you know. Need to get up early again for Russ, Russ over. Now, Russ that Russ is modern life dating guy was glazing hard. He also went on a blind date with Farah on Sneeko stream. Yeah, I heard about that. Um, Talk about bad times, but turn out the, um, I'm trying to think. I don't know if he said anything. Most of my back and forth yeah, on whatever show was, that, was with that Chase guy, I think. I won't 
I've taken that tournament again, not because I'm like mad about it or anything, but because like. I just the other guy seemed way too agreeable. Do you think that was a strategy? Here's the thing. People on my side might look at it as a big loss if I don't completely own them. But I said this on the show. If they all want to say we all agree, that's fine. But I'm going to go back to my podcast saying the exact same stuff I did here. I don't know if that's the case for them. If they agree with me, I think it makes me look strong. I don't think it makes them look strong. Because they they didn't because you got to keep in mind they didn't debate me on they didn't debate me on a single point. The th oh, the thing I was the most shocked on and I think even Myron was shocked on it was I feel like I brought up the divorce thing. The divorce favors men. I feel like both of them tried were like, "What?" And then when I ran down my points, they had nothing to say. <laughs> um other than like the suicide number. And then even Myron was like, whoa, 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 hold on a sec. Did you guys, are you sure you guys don't want to say anything? Yet? And they just, they totally dropped that point. <laughs> that, which is funny because I feel like this whole like women being evil and divorce shit is something that the red pillars fight on so f***ing hard. Um, Men fare better than women in divorce because they tend to make more money. So I'm quoting from an article from The Atlantic in 2016. Despite the common perception that women make out better than men in divorce proceedings, women who work before, during, or after their marriages see a 20% decline in income when their marriages end. According to Stephen Jenkins, professor at the London School of Economics, whose research found that men, meanwhile, tend to see their income rise more than 30% post-divorce. Meanwhile, the poverty rate for separated women is 27%, which is triple the figure for separated men. That's one thing. The second thing is they're more likely to remarry. Quoting from Pure Research, 64% of divorced or widowed men have remarried, compared to only 52% of previously married women um another uh, point three is they don't have the responsibilities of caregiving um i'm quoting from finding caregiving stuff is actually really difficult but it seems to be settled upon that 90 percent of parents will settle custody disputes without a judge um on average women that get child support only get 286 dollars a month um 80 of custodial parents in the u.s are mothers um only 4% of these child custody cases actually go to trial. And in 2017, full child support payments were only received by 46.4% of custodial mothers. So it seems like they, so they've got a lot of extra responsibilities related to caregiving, their income is down. Um, they don't even get full child support all the time. And the child support they make is like pretty low. Um, uh, uh, point number four is if men choose to fight for custody, they oftentimes win it. Um, the largest study I could find on this, this is an older one, but it was the only big scale one I could find, but it was from an old Massachusetts gender bias study, which was published in the New England Law Review. This was in 1990. And they said, we began our investigation of child custody aware of a common perception that there is a bias in favor of women in these decisions. Our research contradicted this perception. Although mothers more frequently get primary physical custody of children following divorce, this practice does not reflect bias, but rather the agreement of the parties and the fact that in most families, mothers have been the primary caretakers of the children. Fathers who actively seek custody obtain either primary or joint physical custody over 70% of the time. My next point is that alimony is rare. Quoting from a legal blog, in the 60s, 25% of divorce settlements included alimony. Now it's like 10%. Um, and it's starting to reverse more for men getting some alimony as women start to earn more. And then the divorce rate has been falling since the 90s. So I don't know why we even talk about this so much. But that's my broad point about divorce. I feel like it's hyped up a ton. But I don't think that men make well, out uh, horribly in divorce, divorce in general. falling in the 90s is because the marriage rate is at an all-time low right now. It, it tracks with the well, marriage rate. Well, that's fine. Rate, but then at least so. you're not having as many people. Well. Oh. Sure, but uh, yeah, I mean, at least you're not having people getting destroyed by the so, so is your argument that men, is, is your argument that women fare better? Because I just so they, I know what they're going to debate here. Mm -hmm. Is your argument that men fare better after divorce, or they just fare uh, not as bad after divorce? My argument is that post-divorce, uh -huh. um, in the actual court proceedings, a woman might win a little bit more. But the yeah. reason why is because post-divorce, men are in a much better position than women who are in a much worse position. Uh, that even if you get like a little bit of alimony and child support, yeah. the fact that you're now a primary full-time caregiver for a child, you have no parental support, that your income is lower, your ability to remarry goes lower, and your poverty rate is much higher. You're so you think what, women are actually worse off after divorce than men? That's yes, your argument. Yes, yes. Women are worse. Yes, off. in almost every measurable metric. I can't find it, except I guess maybe the, the way, suicide it says, thing. It says lack, I looked it up just <laughs> to be objective here. Um, number one cause of divorce. This is lack of commitment, but that's an sure. extremely broad. Yeah, of that course. Be Which just sucks because in relationships, a lot of it's right. Like, for instance, somebody could get divorced because somebody's going to take up the trash. Yeah. Right? But did they really? Or lack of sex. But lack of sex is never about lack of sex. It's usually because other shit is going on sure, too, right? Because yeah. lack of commitment yeah. can be finances too. It so could, yeah, it could yeah, be. Yeah. It's very broad. Or it could Sorry, be a partner gains weight, or it could be. Yeah. It could be any of that. So, you, did you guys have anything? To, so, he's saying women fair. For in every measurable metric, divorce. except for the suicide stat that I've never looked up before, I guess I should have. But yeah, I, I can, I can, I'll text it to you. Yeah, we just got it right now. But it's, yeah, I found, we found the it's nine, nine to one. nine to one, actually. It's yeah. nine times the ratio now. <laughs>
Um, it's, uh, it's, but that also doesn't surprise me, though. But I don't him? think oh, I don't think. Oh, yeah, you guys sorry, have any arguments towards him that uh, women fair? Because he's. I would like to see more battle. recent stats yeah. first of all, to, and then this is the, to be fair. Like this is not the hill I want to die on. I agree. Sure. I think divorce sucks for both people. Yeah, Jesus. You chat with a Timcast girl out all after the show. Um, a little bit before, a little bit after. Donovan Sharp couldn't finish it a bit with the relics of all the studies you guys were bringing up give any cues externally about the status of the fertility is to just stay with one and have sex over a long period of time. But there are still studies that show that women act differently when they are all. They are. Thank bad. you! Studies that show that women have different preferences sometimes when they are different parts. Yes, but it's whether or not they act on those. And this is the importance of measuring extra um, extra partner pairings is that you can ask... This is all... This is... This is... This is... Yeah, this is... All right. Now we're at the point of diminishing returns here. Now we're at the point of diminishing returns. It's just not... This is not... It's... You know, we're... we're I'm not... No. No, that's it. That's it. We're at the point of diminishing returns, man. Like, the, the EPP, no, dude, no, 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 man. No, dude, no. Attraction and arousal, guys, it's not that complicated. It's really not. It's super complicated. Humans are super complicated creatures. We are insanely complicated creatures. We are arguably one of the most complicated creatures on the planet. How can you say that something like our reproduction is very simple? That's not true. It's, it's a pretty complicated dance we do between features and how we act on things and like age and hormones and status of life. And like there's, yeah, but um, is this the dude that had debate a cron? Yeah, basically. Um, real quick, okay, so let's see if I can summarize this in one minute. So. Um, one of the big claims by a lot of these red pill guys, and they stem from Rolo, is this idea that when women are more fertile on their cycle, they will f an alpha guy for good genes. And then when women are in less fertile places of their cycle, they will f a safe guy just to keep him close by. So they're trying to get the genes from the powerful alpha male, and then they're trying to stay safe with the beta male. Okay? And then true alpha males in societies, men's reproductive strategy is to f many women as possible to spread their alpha genes as quickly as possible okay this is the dual mating strategy right that's the dual mating strategy in a nutshell the problem with this is that there hasn't been any research ever to show that women actually pick different partners at different parts of their fertility and there is no evidence that this reproductive strategy has been practiced anywhere because women are not having all these children out of their normal relationships and then having their beta men raise them there's just there's zero data for any of this and the um a lot of the researchers that were initially behind this dual mating hypothesis um i think david buss is one stephen gangstad is another is what they said was well actually when you look at this more the dual mating strategy um the the, the dual mating strategy doesn't really make sense for a few reasons one a big one is that human females don't give off cues when they're fertile right if I, there's a 10 to 50 percent bastard rate, I think there's research. No, extra partner pairings is like one percent, literally. Um, and I know because they did a lot of research on this. There's one French fucking dude. Um, I literally have a study called Cuckolded Fathers Rare in Human Populations. This Larmu uh, so guy, I don't think, has done a few on these. Um, the highest they could find is 5.9 percent in really f communities, but worldwide, it's about one percent. Um, but the, the issue is that uh, human females don't give off external cues when they're um, when they're ready to mate, right? You know how like there are, there are some animals like cats, maybe dogs, where when they're like in heat, they're walking around like ah, me, ah, you know, like you can tell. If you were an alpha male and you wanted to swoop in and you wanted to impregnate um, dogs or cats or whatever at like their optimal fertile time, you could do it. Like you go in, you see they're in heat, you and then you leave, right? But with adult human females that doesn't happen. Those reproductive cues aren't given off. So because that's the case, the, if you're an alpha and you're just trying to spread your seed, somebody one time doesn't even guarantee you that it's a good reproductive strategy. You might not you might not hit it at the right time, right? So it seems like, and because women are horny throughout their entire cycle, not just when they're uh, fertile, the only way to guarantee uh, um, fertilization is probably by somebody for an extended period of time. So if you're a guy, your reproductive strategy has to be somebody for an extended period of time. If you're a woman, um, because you're masking your, and it probably even makes sense if you think about it, a woman doesn't want to give off fertility cues because their, um, their uh, offspring is such high investment, right? It takes a long time to raise a, a human child. So if somebody comes by and leaves and they've gotten you pregnant and then they're able to bounce, it's probably really bad for you. So the only way, so for women, it makes sense why they'd want to conceal when they're the most fertile. 
um, because they don't want an alpha guy to come in and leave. So they need somebody that's going to be uh, caring, non-dominant, um, and and invest high in the offspring. So it makes sense that like non-dominant guys would be the, the preferred reproductive strategy for men. Like th this is essentially what like all the research settled on because they couldn't because the problem was even though women will have slight differences in what they prefer during their ovulation cycle, the actions that they do during these cycles don't seem to match with the dual mating hypothesis at all. Like.
for your mind something 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 for your mind your body 